Welcome to Through the Bible with Les Feldy, a 30-minute walk through the Scriptures, teaching in-depth Bible truths that change people's lives. Now, here's your host, Les Feldy. Okay, good afternoon. It's good to see everybody in again this afternoon. And for those of you joining us on television, it may be morning, it may be midnight, we don't know, but we're glad to have you with us. And again, for anyone that's just a new listener, we always like to remind folks that we're just an informal, uh, non-denominational Bible study. We don't try to uh, attack anyone. We're not trying to kowtow to anyone. We're just going to see what the book says, and uh, that's the way we teach it. And, of course, my main prerogative is to get folks to study it on your own. Don't just sit back and say, well, this is what Les Feldick says, or this is what so-and-so. But learn to search the Scriptures, comparing Scripture with Scripture. In fact, that's why I use as many references as I possibly can. It isn't to show you how much I know. It's to show that when we teach something, that we can base it on more than just one verse, usually. Once in a while, we have to bank on one verse. But... The whole idea is to just compare Scripture with Scripture and uh, with the Holy Spirit's leading determine that you can't always go by what the majority says. In fact, I think I've said it years and years ago, when it comes to the things of the Spirit, the majority is usually wrong. So don't just rest on majority. All right. I uh, don't think we have any special announcements for the television audience. We've already made those that are pertinent for you in the studio. So for those of you in television and for you here in the studio, we're going to jump right in where we left off in our last program, which is in chapter 1 of Revelation. And uh, for sake of uh, exercising our memory, we're going to lead, read the last verse that we ended with, verse 10. And uh, remember, John the Revelator is writing it. And uh, he's on the island of Patmos, quite likely as an exile for his faith. But nevertheless, he has so far not been under evidently any undue persecution. But now in verse 10, he speaks of how he brings this revelation about. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. And remember, I emphasize that does not mean the first day of the week. You put it on the other way around, the day of the Lord. So what he was transported into the seven-year period that all the Scripture refers to, as the day of the Lord. So in an unusual supernatural experience now, John is literally just transported up into these coming seven years of the day of the Lord. All right, now wherever he is, whether he's up in the glory or whatever in this vision experience, he heard behind me a great voice as like a trumpet. Now I think we're all aware that when a trumpet lets go, you, there's no... Well, what did I hear? I mean, it's pretty obvious. And so it's something that even alarmed, I think, John, who is writing. Now this voice says then in verse 11, I am Alpha and Omega. And we know from other portions of scriptures, that's the first and last letters of the Greek alphabet, which refers, of course, to Christ's eternity past and his eternity future. He is without end. He is without beginning. And that, of course, is beyond our human understanding. All right. Now then, the Alpha and the Omega, the Jesus, the Christ who is speaking, says to John, What thou seest in these vision experiences now that are coming, what thou seest, write in a book, not books, write in a book, and send it, not them, unto the seven church. Now, I dare say, if I could take a poll right here in the studio this afternoon, and if I were to ask you how many of you have always had the impression that these seven church letters were individually sent to the seven churches, and I think I'd have 95% that would say, that's what we've always been taught. That's not what it says. God, uh, God is instructing John to take this whole body of truth, these seven church letters, make a book of it, and evidently a copy was sent to every one of the seven churches. And I think as we come on through the chapter, you'll see why that is so pertinent. It wasn't that these few verses belonged to Ephesus and these few to Pergamos and so forth, but that the whole body of truth involved in these seven letters were to put in one book and a copy sent to every one of the seven churches. All right, now then, here they are. Send them to those that are in Asia. Now, we pointed out in our last program that Asia in the New Testament especially is Asia Minor, which is today's land of Turkey. Now, 
even Galatia, to which the book of Galatians was addressed, was central Turkey. And when Paul said uh, back in the book of Acts that he intended to go back into Asia, he was talking about the geographical area that we now call Turkey. All right, now the same way here. These seven little cities are all in western, or were, past tense, they were in western Turkey. Now I think most of you know from, from your Bible maps that Ephesus was on the very western coast of Turkey. It was a seaport. But then fanning out from Ephesus were these other six little cities, almost in a circle. If you look at a Bible map, they're just a bunch of dots. Well, the reason I'm doing this is to make it plain that when we get down here a little further in verse 12, you're going to see that this is a group of Jewish congregations, synagogues, if you please, that now Christ is dealing with having left the temple in Jerusalem many, many years before, and with the temple in Jerusalem shortly be destroyed, he is more or less moving his place of authority now from Jerusalem to the seven churches in Asia. And that's why I'm trying to emphasize that they were in a, in a group, almost in a circle. All right, now let's read on. You'll get what I'm talking about. So he sends this book to the seven churches which in Asia, Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamos, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. Now verse 12, And I turned to see the voice that spoke with me, and being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks. Now the term that we normally think of from the Old Testament and everything is the lampstands. And he saw seven golden lampstands. Now, of course, the purpose of the lampstand was to give light to the area. So what these seven churches were to be, now oh, there again, i got to stop. It's unfortunate. I think it's terribly unfortunate that our English translators use the word churches or church all the way through the New Testament. So much easier to understand if they would have used assembly. Because the word church really is a Scottish word, which was kirk, K-I-R-K, -K, and you've heard that. And from that old Scottish word kirk, the English translators came up with this word church. And I think it's unfortunate. They should rather be called assemblies. And here in this case, they were called what? Do you remember? Synagogues. Remember? Let me go back and show you. I just got to do this over and over because whenever we travel, and of course most of you know we've just come back from four weeks of traveling, and everywhere we go people will comment on the fact that we make these things so plain that they never hear otherwise. And so come back with me to James, chapter 2, if I remember correctly. James, chapter, I hope it's chapter 2. Yeah, chapter 2, verse 2. So that you'll know where I'm coming from. James, chapter 2, verse 2. Where he says, for if there come into your assembly a man with a gold ring and so forth. But now if you have a marginal Bible and look in your margin, what was the word in the Greek? Synagogue. I like when other people agree with that, see? They were synagogues. Well, even today, what do the Messianic Jews call their place of worship? Synagogues. They don't call them a church. They call them a synagogue. All right, now it's the same way here. These were all Jewish congregations having scattered out of the central church in Jerusalem, which was a Jewish church or a Jewish assembly. There was maybe a Gentile or two, but I doubt it. And so from that scattered Gentile or Jewish church in Jerusalem, we have these seven synagogues here in western Turkey. But now you want to remember, these weren't the only ones. There were various assemblies of Jews who had been scattered throughout that part of the world. In fact, we've done this over and over, but repetition, as we hear over and over, is the mother of learning. Come back with me to Acts chapter 11, verse 19. And I've said it many, many times before, and I'll probably say it many times more if the Lord continues to bless me with life, and that this is one verse that probably did more to open my understanding as I teach than any other verse in Scripture. This just bombarded my thinking. Acts 11, verse 19. All got it? I always like to wait here because my television viewers tell me the same thing. Don't go so fast. We can't find them. 
Uh, I don't know whether I shared it with the television audience last week or not, but uh, one place we were down in Florida, uh, there were several families with young kids, and this one little girl, I think if I remember right, she said she was 11 years old, and she came up to me afterwards, and she had all the references that I'd used that evening. Of course, now that was over a period of about two or three hours. She had two whole pages full of references. And I said, do you mean to tell me I used all those tonight? She says, every one of them. <laughs> but this is why we do it, just to give you a chance to see what the book says and not just what I'm saying. All right, Acts 11, verse 19. Now they who were scattered abroad, that is, out of Jerusalem, upon the persecution that arose around Stephen, traveled as far as Phoenix, the island of Cyprus, up to Antioch in Syria, which is present-day north of Lebanon, up toward the Euphrates River, all right, on up to Antioch, and they were preaching the word to who? None but Jews only. All right, now where'd these Jews come from? Back up now a couple more pages to Acts chapter 8, and we have just seen Stephen martyred in chapter 7. <coughs> Because all this just sets the stage. And then you can better understand what the Bible is talking and why it's saying what it does. In Acts chapter 8, verse 1, hun. Acts chapter 8, Stephen has just been stoned in the last couple of verses of chapter 7. And now verse 1. And Saul, who will later become the apostle Paul. And Saul was consenting unto his death. And at that time, at the stoning of Stephen, seven years after Pentecost, remember, this isn't all just within a matter of weeks. This is seven years after Pentecost. And at that time, there was a great persecution against the assembly which was at Jerusalem, the Jewish assembly, the Jewish synagogue of believers that Jesus was the Christ. And they were all, all of that Jerusalem congregation were practically scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except whom? The apostles. See, and I always make note of that. Everybody thinks the twelve have already been out fulfilling the Great Commission for seven years. No, they haven't. They're still in Jerusalem waiting for the return of their Messiah. So anyway, we have to understand that as all these little Jewish writers back here, James and Peter and John, and now as John writes in Revelation, come back there again, chapter 1, that these were Jewish congregations called synagogues. They were still hanging on to the whole concept that Jesus of Nazareth was their promised Messiah. They're still under the law. Don't forget, the temple is still operating. This is probably written in the late 50s, and uh, nothing to indicate that the temple worship had stopped. It was only that they had been scattered out because of Saul's persecution. All right, and so these little seven congregations, especially now then, since they're grouped in almost a circle in western Turkey, become an area that the Lord can almost use as a final habitation for himself. All right, Revelation chapter 1 then again being verse 12. And I turned to see the voice that spoke with me, and being turned I saw the seven golden lampstands, and in the midst of the seven, not in the midst of any one of them, but as these seven comprise a circle of geography, in the midst was the likeness of the Son of Man. Now, stop and think. Does the Apostle Paul ever refer to Christ as the Son of Man? Now, I'm not tricking you. No, not that I know of. He never refers to Christ as the Son of Man. He's the Son of God. He's the Christ but never as the Son of Man. And that, of course, was unique to the book of Matthew. Over and over refers to Jesus as the Son of Man. All right, so in the midst of these seven lampstands representing these seven churches was one like unto the Son of Man. It's God the Son. It's Jesus the Christ. And he's clothed with a garment down to the foot 
Gird about the paps with a golden girdle. Now watch this description of him. His head and his hair were white like wool. And another uh, translation sort of says, or like snow. It was perfectly white. I did say as white as snow. And his eyes were as, doesn't say they are. Now there's a big difference, you know. But they were as flames of fire. And his feet like unto fine brass, as if they burned in a furnace, and his voice the sound of many waters. Now, just in the light of that kind of language, does that speak of a God of love, mercy, and grace, or a God of judgment? Judgment! All these terms speak of judgment. Brass, way back in the tabernacle. What was the brazen altar? Well, it was the place of sacrifice where sin was judged. The brazen serpent, when it was raised on the pole so that Israel could look at it. What did it speak of? Judgment. So brass is always that which speaks of judgment. Well, the same way with uh, the flames of fire. It spoke not of love and grace, but judgment, see? And then you come down to the, uh, the feet like they were burned in a furnace. Well, to being burned in a furnace doesn't speak of love and grace. It speaks of what? Judgment. So what's the picture? Now remember, ever since we started the little letter of James, what do these Jewish believers anticipate right out in front of them? Tribulation. The seven years of God's wrath and vexation is right in front of them. So the whole thrust here is to prepare these believers for a coming judgment. But now I know the question is, well, why should these believers come under that judgment? Has it ever been any different? You know what's the matter with us in America, and I'm included? We've been spoiled. Do you realize that this is the only time in all of human history, that is, since our forefathers came to these shores, and we in America especially have enjoyed such religious freedom without any fear. That's never happened before. All through human history, the believers, whether it was Israel or whether it was later on the Christian community, they suffered constantly. You know, I'm always stressing, when Paul would come into these Gentile cities like Thessalonica and Corinth, and these folks were were one to salvation out of paganism into Christianity, what was the first thing they faced? I call it the buzzsaw of persecution. I hope you all know what a buzzsaw is, what you cut wood with. Intense persecution. It's always been that way. If you know anything about uh, ancient history, the Dark Ages, if I'm not mistaken, there is one history book that maintains that during that thousand years, from 500 A.D. to 1500 A.D., 50 million Christians, believers, lost their life through persecution. So you see, for us to live in a time of such tranquility is not the normal. It's the unusual. And so same way in this time. These Jews were used to persecution, but now, you see, they're also being faced with the coming wrath and vexation of God. Now again, for sake of repetition, come back with me to Psalms chapter 2, and this is where I get the language that I use. Psalms chapter 2. I don't make it up as I go, believe me. Psalms chapter 2, which I always call the outline of the Old Testament program that Christ would be rejected in the early verses. Verse 4, Psalms chapter 2, in the first three verses, the anointed one is rejected, which of course is a reference to the crucifixion. Jews and Gentiles both reject him. Then verse 4, God sitting in his heaven will laugh at the foolishness of men. He'll have them in derision, confusion, Verse 5, then, the next thing on God's program, then he will speak unto them in his what? Wrath and vexation. In other words, he's going to pour out his anger 
on the whole human race, of which, of course, the nation of Israel will be the vortex in judgment as well as in other revelations. But it's going to be an outpouring of wrath and vexation. And then the next thing on the agenda is what? The kingdom. The king sitting on the holy hill of Zion. All right, so all of Scripture has that unfolding of God's agenda for the human race. Now, remember, as we've been pointing out for the last several weeks or months, that there's not a word about the church age in prophecy. Not one word. It's all how God will deal with the nation of Israel in particular, the whole human race in general, and then after the rejection of their Messiah and his ascension, then was to come the wrath and the vexation, the judgment, the wrath of God, and then that would set the stage for the coming of Christ the second time. Now, of course, we've stressed, we know, that God opened that timeline, stopped the wrath and vexation before it happened, and brought in the church age. But we're not dealing with that here in Revelation. We're dealing with the seven-year period of the wrath and vexation that was programmed into the Old Testament prophecies. All right, so now we can come on down to verse 16. So now this Son of Man, who is revealing himself to this transplanted area of God dealing with Israel, to these little seven churches, synagogues, assemblies. It's amazing what habit does, doesn't it? I've been trying for years to quit calling these churches, and I just can't do it <laughs> because it's habit. But they were not churches as we think of the church. They were Jewish synagogues. They were Jewish called out assemblies. All right? So now then again in uh, chapter 1, where we have the, the con coming judgment of the Son of Man. All right? Verse 16. He has in his right hand seven stars, one for each one of these seven assemblies. And out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword. Now, the casual reader, what does he immediately vision? Standing there with a dagger in his mouth. No, that's not the picture at all. What is the sword? The Word of God. Now come back with me to Hebrews chapter 4, hon. Back to Hebrews. Because, again, we do this for the benefit of new listeners who haven't been with us over the years. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. The Scripture always interprets itself. Always. And we're finding listeners that are learning that. I had a letter again just yesterday that he never knew how accurately the Scripture interpreted itself. All right, Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. For the Word of God is quick. It's alive. That's what the word quick means here in our King James, at least. So the Word of God is alive. It's powerful. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. It's able to pierce even to the dividing asunder or the setting apart the soul and the spirit, which I always define as as intertwined as Siamese twins. But the Word of God can separate them. All right, it pierces even the dividing apart of the soul and spirit, the joints and marrow. Now again, don't lose the subject. And the Word of God is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Have you ever had somebody tell you, I never sin? Have you? Iris has. I've had. Oh, I never sin. You don't ever think an evil thought? Oh, well, that's not sin. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, no. God sees them. That's a sobering thought, isn't it? That every thought, God sees it. I don't know if he wants to watch them all, but it's within his realm of capability. And that's what the Word of God is capable of doing. All right, back to Revelation chapter 1 once again. Just got a couple minutes left. All right, so go back up to verse 14. And his head and hair were white like wool, as white as snow. All right, now let's see how, since this is all Jewish, it's all connected with the Old Testament in one way or another. Now come back with me to Daniel. 
chapter 7, and we'll see the same identical language because God is dealing with the same people. Now again, Paul does not make this kind of a description of Christ because it isn't necessary for us. But for Israel, it meant everything in the world to realize that their scriptures tied together. Daniel chapter 7, verse 9. Daniel chapter 7, verse 9. And of course, this is the same vision where he sees the Gentile empires in uh, coming down the pipe of history, and he sees them as wild animals rather than the gold, silver, and so forth that Nebuchadnezzar saw. But now here he comes down to verse 9. I beheld, or he saw in this vision, until the thrones, that is, of these various empires were cast down. And the Ancient of Days did sit, whose garment was white as snow, the hair of his head like pure wool. Do you see the comparison? Almost word for word. His throne was like the fiery flame, and his wheels as burning fire. A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. Now this is a view of the throne room, remember. Thousands, thousands, that's millions, ministered unto him. And 10,000 times 10,000 stood before him. Now here's exactly what Revelation is talking about. And the what? The judgment. The judgment was set and the books were open. Now here we see then that God in Daniel, as well as in Revelation, and as well in other places, is also going to be the God of judgment. Now today, we're not under his judgment. We're under his grace. We're under his mercy. We're under his love. But his patience is going to run out one day. And when that runs out, then is going to come judgment like the world has never seen. Now we know he judged the world at the flood. And it was awesome, but that was nothing compared to what's coming. What's coming is going to be beyond human description. And I think that even a lot of my class people, when I read these verses concerning the day of the Lord, they don't really want to believe it. It just is so beyond comprehension. Thank you for watching Through the Bible with Les Feldick. Through the Bible is a partner-supported ministry. If this program has been a help to your study of the Scriptures and you'd like to see others enjoy the teaching, your support would be greatly appreciated. Write to us at Les Feldick Ministries, 30706 West Lona Valley Road, Kenta, Oklahoma, 74552, or call 1-800-369-7856. Remember, all programs are available in printed form, audio cassette, and videotape. Be sure to tune in next time to Through the Bible with Les Felding.